Thanks a lot. Oh. Uh, so thanks a lot. I guess I'll start with uh, why, I, why I came up with the idea for this talk. Uh, I'm kind of since a few years to the DRM i915 Intel Graphics kernel maintainer. And graphics is a bit special because every driver, every GPU has their own private interface to memory allocation. Uh, submission of, of GPU commands to the hardware and all these things. So we don't just have like a, a one generic interface. We have one interface for each driver. So we have lots and lots of... Uh, I, what, ha what just happened? Oh, I thought I switched up. Yeah. Doesn't look good for my quality, says graphics maintain. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Don't, like, take pictures of that. Oh. So, we have lots and lots of IOCs, all written by kind of driver maintainers, like me and you know, people with Clue. So, and the other thing is also cheap is, like, change all the time. Every two years, everything changes completely, and we need to throw out stuff, make new stuff. Uh, of course, the problem is with user space interfaces, you, you're never going to get rid of them. So, like, if you... Put it up. Ah, you're gonna live with these mistakes for like ten years at least, something like that. And I've also spent a lot of time kind of cleaning up ISATL code and legacy code and trying to fix old mistakes. So that's essentially where I'm coming from. And I noticed when people talk about ISATLs, they're often discussing things as you absolutely need to do that. The I as a maintainer would just not even really look at the patch and just outright you checked it. So I figured uh, we seem to have quite a good. Oh no. That wasn't me. Uh, we seem to have quite strong opinions and best practices and how to do user space interfaces simply because we have so much experience in getting it wrong. So uh, that's what my talk is going to be about. Uh, is it going to... Did it just freeze? That's kind of awkward. Well, that's better. So pretty much all the things I'm going to talk to you about now, we don't screw it up and kind of have the bone marks to prove it. So it's going to be three parts, roughly. The first is, is, is the basics, like if you don't do this, if you get that wrong, you might as well forget it and never use the shiny new IOCTAL number that you've assigned again because it's just hopeless. Uh, Second part is about technicalities. That's usually what, what people bring up when they talk about getting IOC details right. There's stuff like padding your you, you structure so that you don't end up writing compact layers and things like that, which is uh, a bit embarrassing. And uh, at the end, is, I'm going to talk about a bunch of special topics. I expect that's kind of when uh, the really opinionated stuff is are going to come in. So, I mean, this is primarily about uh, experiences from graphics drivers and, and maintainers like me and, and, and Dave much more. Uh, but if you have like other war stories that kind of contradict things, I'm kind of trying to show, hey, uh, I very much welcome the input. We can have a bit of discussion. Oh, if you don't agree with things, so, uh, if you any anything, please, uh, Raise the question, so say, so, let's get started. Uh, the basics first is like, do you even need an IOC TL? Uh, because, yeah, I just, I just kind of the easiest choice is to have a device drive and you, you do that, and mostly you can sneak it under the, the eyes of kind of the, the, the senior kernel hackers and trying to get something in that no one really reviewed. Uh, I mean, one example is hey, the, the KD boost stuff. The reviewers are like, why should this do a proper system call? So, so that's kind of one, one question. The other is, often with device drivers, uh, if you do an IOCTL, 
why don't you just like use read, write, and pull and all that stuff on, on, on the file descriptor? So, I mean, it's all there. You can all use that. And, and very often, these operations make a lot of sense. I'm, I'm going to talk about file descriptors and stuff some later on in, in the special case topics. Uh, there's also like lots and lots of other interfaces that the kernel has, which, which are not like yeah, system calls or anything like that. There's, yeah, SSFS config, especially debug FS. If you have something that only your task suite needs that no one else needs, maybe put it there to, to kind of hide it better so that people with production systems never ever see it, which is nice because that means they can also never ever complain to you about the regression or breakage. Uh, and the other thing is there's lots and lots of subsystems that kind of do in well, not, maybe not a perfect job, but there's lots of encoded experience about lessons learned and things. So reuse them. For example, in, with, with JPUs, we, we're currently working on, on the Intergraphics driver to, to expose performance counters to uh, user space. And of course, we could do an IOCTL and, and reinvent our own ring buff and do all these stupid things and learn the lessons again. Or we could just reuse both. Of course, that means we get to deal with Thomas Glexner a bit. But, uh, yeah, long term, that might be better. So, that's, that's kind of the first thing you really should be asking. Like, what's the right interface type for the thing you want to expose to user space? The other really basic thing you absolutely need to have is a real world user space implementation, your user of your interface. A demo is just not going to cut it. And I mean by real world, I mean it needs to be tested, it needs to be reviewed by whatever project you want to use it. For example, if you have some great new idea that's going to make databases faster, have a fully tested, reviewed, and ready for merging patch for Postgres. Oh, for graphics, obviously, oh, the requirement is that the entire stack is implemented. So we don't just want the kernel side. We want the, 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 the interface shim and lib DRM. We, we require the, the OpenGL feature. Oh, sorry. OpenGL feature implementation in the Mesa library, and we require all the piglet OpenGL test cases to really make sure your interface actually survives the real world and doesn't like fall apart once you kind of have to deal all with, the, with all the corner cases, with, with the error handling. I think a great example that Michael Carries always kind of brings up in when he's discussing interfaces is, is all the file notify APIs which all kind of been designed with demos. And then people try to actually use them and implement them. And uh, this is where you can't recover in any other way but by throwing away and rescanning the entire file system, which is not so great. So really, I may to be production code. You need to have it. That's the only way to remotely make sure that the semantics of your interface are correct. I mean, if you don't get this right, you can throw away your article. If you get one of the technicalities wrong that I'm going to talk about later on, there's no problem. You just make a version 2 and implement version 1 on top of version 2, which is doable as long as the semantics are kind of the same. And that's why you need to have this. But there's a very big thing. Always merge the kernel patches first. Because there's a good chance that some random review will spot some minor data. And your interface is going to slightly change. If you have shipping user space out there that's using your interface, the old version of the interface that you kind of develop, you screwed. Because you, you can just throw away that IOC and never use it again because the existing user space that's shipped out there will not work with the version that's actually merged into the kernel. So always merge the, uh, the kernel patch first and then merge the user space. Oh. That's actually such a hard and fast rule that, that they fairly broke compilation of a bunch of user space components when people violated that rule. So that's really, we're not going to discuss about that in, in the graphics world. Where's the button? 
The next basic thing is test cases. So you have your real world user space thing, and it kind of does, at least beyond reasonable, the proof that your interface is not totally broken, but it's not going to test all the other things. And all the other things are usually all those bits and pieces that are going to score your CVU or some other disaster. So you really need to have test cases. You need to have lots of test cases for all the corner cases and, and the things that people use to break into your kernel and all the things you kind of can't test with a functional level. Uh, that's, that's pretty much going to be a running gag in my talk, test cases. So there's... I'm going to bring up lots of examples where I think you really need to test this and that. So we're going to be more specific about this uh, uh, later on. So, so that's kind of the basics. They're going to make hopefully sure that uh, you, you shiny new system call or ISCTL or whatever, or the new interface is salvageable. But this... Uh, Technicalities, and it's kind of nice to get them right because uh, if you don't get them right, you end up writing a compact layer, and that's just boring, busy work. And it's also somewhat hilarious for everyone else to kind of watch you do that. Um, so, the rules there is if you do a struct that's part of your ABI, only use the, the, the full special type diff. Uh, uh, types that the kernel has, the double underscore S32, U32, S64, and U64. I mean, the reason for this special version is that the kernel is kind of older than C99, so all the U and T underscore T kind of types are no go. I mean, nowadays C99 is kind of old, so you're not actually going to be all that successful in actually breaking user space and making it fail to compile if you'd use the, the, the C99. Yeah? Uh, you might want to mention the use of PA hole, the tool for this, to actually dump the memory layout of the structure to see whether it's actually all properly aligned is actually really useful for making sure the ABI is correct. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a nice tool, especially if you're kind of screwed up and you want to know where the holes are that you actually put right. in. PA hole is really nice too. Oh, thanks. So, um, but the thing is, it's still really nice and useful to use these types because if you're kind of running around the C-scope in your kernel files, uh, at least me, and I usually don't notice that I'm in a user space header file. But if I see these types, I realize, okay, this is ABI. I better be very careful when I touch this. So it's still, I think it's still really useful to just use these types. Um, then, like, They've just said, this is entire topic with padding and alignment. So if you just use 32-bit uh, integers, you're going to be fine. But if you use a 64-bit one, align everything to 64-bit and pad manually. And then you can use PA hole or something like that to check whether you didn't actually accidentally put a hole in there. So both align all the members and the size of the structure because eventually someone is going to do uh, an array of these and things like that are going to use size of, for example, a size of in the ISCTL, which uh, the size of the structure is encoded in the ISCTL number. So that's going to slightly change. And the next one is pointers are 64 bit unsigned. Shocking to know. Uh, and finally, if you did screw up, uh, just use attribute packed or, or manually pad it up to, to, to whatever you kind of alignment that you do have and then uh, take out all the humility you have and write your compact layer. So, uh, with that out of the way, I mean, that's kind of the boring stuff. You can pretty much, if you Google for, for IOCTL design, this piles and piles of explanations of all that. Uh, the next technicality is input validation. And, and there's, there's kind of two reasons why you need to be really, really careful about this. The first thing is if you allow user space to supply random stack garbage or register garbage, that's going to break your extendability. 
Because essentially that field or that register or whatever it is is not useful. Because at least on old kernels, if you, if you didn't check for, the, for, for, for garbage in these values, uh, anything was valid input in there. So you can't decide whether the application accidentally wanted to have the new feature or whether it just accidentally set this value. So that's one thing, always check all your input because otherwise you can't extend your interface. The other thing I saw, if you don't check all your input, some uh, people will try to, to, to figure out whether they can put something evil inside these values that kind of bypasses your checks. And, and then, yeah, like I said, scores you a nice CV, which uh, is, is again not too great. So what you actually should be checking, in addition, is, is all kinds of overflows, like, like array sizes, like adding two numbers, and all these stupid things that C, unfortunately, influence upon us. So, uh, yeah, any time you multiply, add, or do generally anything by, uh, with values supplied by user space, you have to double, uh, do, to check that you don't or uh, anything else like that. And the other kind of important thing is, and it's especially important if you have like a big complicated interface that has grown uh, over time and has grown lots of, of different modes and combinations, check all the invalid combinations of, of, of flags and values. So if you don't set that flag and then the, the, the array should be zero, zero size, check for that. Because if you're unlucky, you kind of assume in your code that no one is going to put, give, you, give you input data that doesn't make sense. So your code implicitly assumes that if that is like, that flag's not set, the array is zero, and suddenly you have like yet another exploit at hand. So, so especially take good care with all combinations and, of course, have test cases for everything. Because, at least in my experience, it's, it's generally really hard to review code that does input validation because you don't see the, all the checks that are missing. And that, 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 those are the importance. Whereas if you write a test case, you, you have a different mindset. You look at the input, entire input space and just go through all the combinations and make sure, okay, this should be rejected. This one should be accepted and result in blah or something else. And, and so you can go through all of them and make sure that you have a test for all of them and make sure that it either gets rejected with the error code you can expect or it does what you expect it to do. So... That, that's one of the major reasons why you need to have a special uh, test suite on top of your real-world user space thing that hopefully also has a test suite to make sure that the functionality at a high level is, is, is correct. So, that's. Now, this, uh, this is a special case with Flax. With, with input validation. I think nowadays it's pretty much common knowledge that you should have a flax parameter. Even the, the kernel is full of version 2, 3, 4 ISATLs just to add the flag parameter and system calls and things like that. But the thing is, so you added that flag parameter, you're really proud that you didn't screw up and unfortunately you forgot to check whether it's zero and reject that with an email. Someone is going to give you stack garbage and the flux parameter is totally useless. So really make sure that you do check for flux equals zero and reject that with the inval because yeah, otherwise it's just gonna have version two of your interface. If you don't use the flag, check that it is not set by the by the user space. Yeah exactly check for flux equals equals zero. If you start using Exactly, because yeah, then you have user space that gives you garbage. Someone will not will get that wrong. It just happens, uh, and yeah, then the flags parameter is totally useless because you can't differentiate between garbage and intentional garbage. And have a test case for it because you're gonna forget about this. And 
The other thing that Flax, and that kind of ties back to the, the thing about combinations and, and the invalid combinations on the previous slide, really check for all the invalid flag parameters because it's super easy to squeeze something in there that you can assume didn't work. For example, you, you, you have a, a bunch of enums in, in your Flax and you just have five, but three bits kind of gives you eight values and unfortunately the three other values cause problems and things like that. So really check for all the flags. It's super easy to, 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 to squeeze our interesting books into flag parameters if you, if you don't properly validate them. That's kind of another technicality is is the and that's kind of, I mean, the entire point of flax parameters is to have some means to, to be able to extend the interface without like breaking old user space. Uh, and that's something you need to think about anyway, is, is compatibility both, in both ways. So that old user space and new kernels and new user space and old kernels both kind of work. So one thing is, is like I said, merge the kernel stuff before you merge the user space stuff. Unfortunately, because otherwise you're going to end up with interfaces that are kind of not compatible. And so you already lost before you really started. So one trick we do use in the DRM system quite often is hide the, a, new, a big new interface between a, a module option that kind of taints the kernel and needs to be explicitly set and kind of looks dangerous. The thing is, you can kind of stretch the, your window by, by one to two kernel releases because by, by that time user space is all over the place and essentially already uh, using your interface you can't change it anymore. So for actual, once you kind of have your interface and it's frozen down and locked down, for actual backwards and forwards compatibility it's like, yeah, have a flux parameter every day for everything. The other thing is, is have, uh, there's, there's kind of some, some other, I mean, Sometimes the flags parameter is kind of not good enough because by the time user space wants to do your system call or IRCTL, it's kind of too late already. For example, with JPUs, you, you have to construct this massive command stream. And you kind of need to decide while you construct that command stream which features you can use. So by the time you do the actual command submission to the kernel, it's already way too late if the kernel then tells you, oh, sorry, I'm a too old version, I can't do this for you. So you kind of need a driver capability flax. Uh, that's, that's what the i915 driver does. Uh, the Raiden driver just has like interface revision that they increment every time they add something. I mean, there's kind of, both approaches have, have their pros and cons. Uh, the driver capability thing does lead you to maybe believe that you could disable something without the other. But fact this kind of that user space just assumes that when one capability A has been released before capability B, when, when they check for B, A is always going to be around. So it's a bit dangerous. Uh, one thing we also do a lot in DRM is, is user space opt-in in Flax. And the user space says like, okay, I'm, I'm new. I, I understand these new concepts. Uh, one example is... Uh, the recent introduction of, of universal planes, I mean, traditionally the, the display side of DRM had like the concept of the primary plane, which is just like your desktop and the cursor moving around. And then people added additional overlay planes for video and, and, and compositing and valent, for example, and then kind of realized, well, the primary plane and the cursor, but that's just normal planes. So why don't we expose just just expose all the planes as plane objects. But of course, all user space would then see the primary plane and the primary plane object and think there's two different things. So for that case, we have a, an opt-in flag. The user space says, I understand this. Please give me the full list of objects and I'm not gonna use like both the legacy primary plane and the new plane primary plane object because I know it's actually the same thing. And so there's lots of, of, of cases where user space has to explicitly opt in into, in, into the new behavior. So that's uh, another way. One thing, and that's probably a bit legalist lawyer trick, is 
I mean, the point here is to avoid regressions and all that. And it's only a regression if there's an actual bug report from a user. So if you can somehow trick your user into not realizing that you've just broken their system, you can get away with it. And we've actually done that. Uh, in in the i915 driver, we have the big break is kind of kernel mode setting and user space mode setting. And all the code for user space mode setting is horrible. We that was written a long time ago. It's full of security holes and horrible things and things ways to for user space to crash. So we kind of want to get rid of that. Unfortunately, we've only switched to kernel mode setting like five years ago, which is way too too new for for like just throwing the thing out. But the X server transparently falls back to the VESA driver if, if the real driver doesn't work. So what we do, we load the, uh, the module. We do not load the driver. That way users don't realize that the driver didn't load because LS mod still shows i915. And then the X tries to load the Intel driver. That doesn't load because the driver, is, uh, the, the kernel interface isn't there. Falls back to VESA and we get all the a nice features of that. And the only real regression is that it's no longer accelerated. But the fact is, these chips are so, these old chips, where people are kind of stuck on these old versions, are so slow that, well, CPU rendering is actually faster. So we got away with breaking user space uh, as long as, 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 as no one notices. I mean, other examples is like, just ship new versions of your, your user space tooling that kind of use the new interface, then wait for a few years for all the distributions to upgrade to the new toolings, and then maybe you get lucky and don't break all the scripts. Of course, there's interfaces where this is impossible, like system calls used by LibSeq. Essentially, you have to keep them around until the heat heat death of, of the universe. But still, uh, it's only a regression and the only broken compatibility if someone actually knows. And that does help quite a few times. One last thing, that's NDNS. It's, it's terrible. I mean, in, in the GPU world, some people do actually care about that because Raiden did ship on PowerPC machines. It breaks all the time. So the, the, the hardware, and the hardware is really nice. It has all the bits where you can tell it, well, my command stream is in big engine, but the, the textures over there, they're in little engine. You have all these bits to fiddle. And so it should work, but the matter of fact is the world is little engine. And so there's like two users on PowerPC or something like that who care about this and occasionally like every few years report box and then someone tries to fix it up. So, and the same thing is kind of network is little onion and all that stuff. So in almost all cases, you can just say we're in a little onion world and mostly get away with it. But if, if anything that you pass around between kernel and user space kind of goes over the network or lands on disk or comes from disk, like on graphics where you have uh, uh, textures or, or video streams and stuff that you load from disk, uh, it might be worth to think like for two seconds about this. So that's with the technicalities. So let's, uh, let's look at a few, few, few other topics. One is uh, resources, all kinds, like allocating memory or, or, or syn synchronization objects. And the thing is, attach everything to a struct file because when the process dies, all the files get closed and you can release all these things and not leak stuff. The other thing is, do you consider standardized file types? So if you want to share or expose some memory object, and maybe you want to allow user space to pass that to some other driver, uh, use DMA both. We, we don't reinvent the world. And there's, uh, there's also fences, which are currently just Android only for synchronization. Uh, another nice new thing is, for example, MemFD, which is passing around memory blocks. And so, so, so that's the other thing. And, 
The really important bit is every time you have an interface that opens a, a file descriptor, like allocate the dnable object or something, have a flag parameter for close on exec semantics. Because, I mean, honestly, I didn't really understand for a long time why you would need this. It kind of didn't make sense. The reason for that is in multi-threaded applications, there might be one thread using your shiny iOS ATL, while the other thread is in some random library which does like a uh, fork and exec uh, uh, some helper script tooling. So if, if that thing opens, if your library opens a, a file descriptor and not with the close and exec call, and the other thread does a fork, which means your, your, your file descriptor gets duplicated, and then an exec, you leak that file descriptor into that binary, and creative people have used that to exploit things. Because maybe that file is running in a different like security context, well, that executable, uh, executable, or things like that. So you really want to have a, a OCLO exec flag to, to close that gap. The next thing is, is about uh, uh, sharing resources, topics like that. I mean, file descriptors is all nice because you can just pass around them on Unix, the main sockets. KDBus will support for, uh, passing file descriptors around. It's all really great. Unfortunately, there's some things where you have so many objects that file descriptors just kind of don't scale, at least not by default. One example is a user space uh, GPU buffer objects where some desktop environments easily have a few thousands of them. So for these special cases, it's kind of okay to have a, an ideal lookup table on your device file or something like that. Uh, but yeah, like I said, don't do it like DRM and reinvent your own resource sharing and, and passing this because it, it's kind of annoying. It, you're most likely not going to think about security all that much, so you make it there. Uh, Everyone can get at the shared object kind of thing, which is not so great. Uh, another thing is if, if you actually have a use case of passing around objects, uh, think about uniqueness requirements. Like, does your user space on the other side need to know whether the thing it gets is the same thing it might have gotten from the other side? Uh, I know this is important for GPUs because the command stream validation does not allow like back references. So if you give it the same buffer twice, it's going to tell you, no, I can't check this and validate this. So user space needs to know whether it got the same buffer twice. But something like the, the Wayland RX server, I can't really trust its client all that much. The client might say, oh, have a U buy your V buffer here with the three planes, but I'm going to give you the same buffer object for all three planes. So it needs to know on input time that it's the same buffer object. Um, kind of the nice way to do that would be with, with FSTAT. Unfortunately, that means uh, you get to implement the full virtual file system, which is a bit much work. So what we actually do in the DRM world, yeah. Uh, yeah. Process going to be helped help there? CO. The sealed memory where. That solves a different problem. Okay. I mean, the, the sealed memory thing is so that you, the receiver can be assured that you either don't change the memory anymore, which simplifies the input validation thing, because then it doesn't need to copy. It could just check in place with, without the other side kind of being snaky and changing things. And the other thing is uh, you can also see like just the size of your shared memory block so that if you memory map it, it, it you, you kind of have an assurance that uh, the other side doesn't just shrink the file and you then get the sick buzz. So different problem. Uh, but yeah, what we, what we in, in DRM is just when you import and it's the same object, we give you back the same uh, integer ID in your local namespace, and that way user space can figure out that it's the same thing. Uh, the other thing is, uh, is about revoke. If you have kind of any 
any global resources that uh, are not shareable, like GPU memory or things like that. Think about Revoke so that you can have like multi-user setups. Oh, and DRM has got that because of some historical ac accidents with, with multi. Then, which, for example, LogInd can execute, but not your X server. And if you switch from one X server to the other X server, and the first X server does not want to give up the display hardware, LogInd just takes it away. So that is it's a very special uh, case. Uh, the other thing is also if you actually have shareable objects, like your GPU memory address space, think about properly isolating different clients. Uh, the, the thing there is uh, uh, the memory mapping support on, in, in DRM was, was broken like that because you don't want to do a, a memory map operation from an ISCTL because then Valgrind won't understand it, which is a bit annoying. So you want to do a memory map on like you, you, you file, the device node file, but we've forgotten to restrict memory maps from other clients for buffers it doesn't there. So be careful there. Uh, the next thing is slightly hilarious, it's signals. I mean, everyone hates them, at least I do. Unfortunately, this is Unix and there's no way to avoid them. Either no one is going to use your system call or ISCTL or someone will use them and just love signals. So, you do need to have an answer. Unfortunately, the mandate is completely useless. It says something about slow devices can return E into. Um, yeah, well, the question is, what's a slow device? Essentially, it's the other way around. If you ever see an e-inter, you have a slow device. So, the man page is totally useless. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and the thing is, like, maybe the next kernel version that suddenly started to, or the, so the maintainer decided, well, maybe we should make, we should make processes at least killable, and suddenly your device changed from fast to slow. It's the man page says it can sleep forever. Yep. Sleeping is kind of allowed, and forever is hard to prove or not prove. <laughs> People are usually not not like. So one solution is just require that your user space handles e inter correctly. In all cases, that's just not going to work. Uh, the other one is. Uh, just don't ever uh, break your you, you blocking sleeps anyway, which, uh, I mean, both cases are uh, solutions of the kind of, I'd like to have a pony, because users are going to really be pissed if they can't interrupt and, and stop your applications. So, oh, uh, that's not going to work. The next one is killable weights, which is kind of nice because you only need to care about when the pro uh, recovering from an interrupt when your process actually dies. But if you do an ISCTL, that ISCTL is a file descript, and someone else might have a dupe from that file descript. So if the process dies, the thing actually doesn't disappear. And that duping thing is really common. For example, LogND has it for the revoke. The X server has it. Sorry. Oh, this was five. I thought the only was that. Anyway, the, the X server has it to share it with, with clients and all these things. So that's kind of not that great a solution. And the other thing is also really hard to test. Like, because you only can test all that recovery code to, by killing a process. So it's really hard to figure out whether anything worked correctly or whether your driver will fall over the next time around you use it. So. The solution we, we pretty much use in 9 on 15 is uh, to stop worrying and blow off signals. Uh, the thing is, once you decided that you have to be able to restart all your things, it makes testing your error recovery code really easy. 
because you have all these functional test cases, all these test cases for corner cases, and the way you check error handling code is you just add new sub copy paste the sub tests of all these test cases. The a second process bombards the first process that does the actual testing all the time. And if that's not enough test coverage, you just add more uh, killable, uh, waitable sleep, interruptible sleeps, or manually inject e interrupt uh, points. And, and yeah, the, the, the nice thing is that e inter is an error code, but definition it's a recoverable one. So we still have all the correctness guarantees. You can run any kind of application, constantly interrupt them, and if those things work, it gives you reasonable assurance that your error code is not totally screwed up. Which is nice because that's one of the things evil people like to exploit. So summary, my recommendation is pretty opinionated, support full restart. Just do it. Uh, the other thing is, because the application writers will still get it all wrong, have for your subsystem driver whatever one function, subsystem IOCTL, which does the restarting for you unconventionally. So that no one ever gets an e enter and just falls over with, uh, with like a segmentation violation or something else. Because the thing is, the bug reports will come to you because it's your library, not the other programs, programs, yeah, you library functions are in the back trace. Uh, then exploit the interhandling for testing, because it's really nice. Or just don't do any like sleep and waits and do it all with fallible file descriptors. That's kind of one way to, to dodge the bullet here. So, that's the thing on, on signals. Uh, do we have any questions? I'm running a bit late overall. Otherwise, I guess I can throw in a few more things. What is about time? The thing is, time is relative. And you realize that really quickly as soon as you start to grab time stand from various hardware blocks because they're just not synchronized. So. First thing, make it really explicit to user space and then you can interface thing which kind of time source you're using. If you do anything on the CPU, just grab a clock monotonic because that's what DRAM also and video for Linux are using, so you have a good chance to actually match with the other subsystems and drivers. Uh, if it's if you're sampling or Harvey clocks give user space some way to synchronously grab a timestamp so that its own tracing and logging can use the same clock and you don't have like the effect that the CPU size is kind of not synchronized with what the GPU does or your device driver does. Which, yeah, kind of, we started rendering here and then completed here, but we kind of received the bytes here. The, before the rendering actually got, that doesn't make sense and kind of confuses people. The other thing is, well, use 64 bit seconds and 64 bit nanoseconds because the thing called 32 bit overflow that happens in 2038, it's kind of a thing. And again, be really paranoid about input validation to make sure that no one likes the stupid tricks with overflowing one side and then you thought you had a positive timeout but actually kind of big go around and produce seconds or some insane thing like that. Um, so that's kind of on some, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, the other thing is waiting, like I said, just use polable FTs. There's some people who thought really hard about how to make that scale and work well. Uh, the other thing is support absolute timeouts because if you have this restarting behavior and you need your own weight ioctal uh, and, and the thing is every time you restart if you have a relative timeout it starts to skew. So just do absolute timeouts and if you get a relative timeout because you screwed up your interface and extended it later on with a flux, just convert everything in an absolute time. There's some fundamentalist apparently who think this is really horrible because you're supposed to only have the timeout right around the weight. But the thing is user space is not going to be able to tell the difference. I mean, again, if no one reports the bug, it's not one. 
So if you do the absolute time, it kind of includes all the setup and teardown and whatever CPU time you waste around. It doesn't matter because you're still going to sleep as long as, at least as long as kind of your absolute time, right? I'm over the time, actually. A little bit, at least. So documentation, that's kind of an afterthought. I really think you should have test cases and because they give you an executable specification. And that's so much better than anything written because people just disagree about what English means, whereas CPUs are pretty strict. Uh, one thing is, if you have a very generic IOCTL or maybe even a system call, to consider to write a man page, you can at least make Michael Clarisk's life a bit easier. Uh, the other thing is, there's tons and tons of documentation, something ABI, and honestly, I don't think anyone really uses it that much. I tend to completely ignore it. There is some subsystem uh, 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 cases where, where maintainers insist that you update the documentation in there, but I mean, just submit the patch, get yelled at, and fix it up. Because yeah, people tend to ignore documented. So, summary, only two minutes over the time, have a real world user because otherwise no one is going to check whether your semantics are actually correct. Then have test cases for everything, for all your corner cases, for all your error handling using, using interrupts and, and, and IOCTL restarting and, and all these things. Don't screw up the technicalities too bad. On the other hand, it's not a disaster if you do so. In this case, people will laugh at you and you get to write a compact layer. And, and finally, think a bit about documentation and maybe decide not to. So, that's pretty much uh, the lessons learned from writing graphics driver and totally getting it wrong. Thank you for listening. I guess we don't have